The third one, uh, I think, it seemed to me that it had a lot shorter time frame to do it in. Uh, the second one was, was, you know, by far the most difficult of all of them to work on. But the third one had, had a very, in this, this sort of a tighter production schedule with a lot more shots, and they, I suppose they were a lot more action-oriented also. But it wasn't, I didn't have any sort of sense that, that here's the third film, and it's going to be, you know, it's going to have, everything's going to have to be faster than anything we've done before, although it sort of came out that way in doing it. And, uh, you know, it was, just, uh, it was just a big, huge, massive, you know, project like the other two. But I think we got a lot better, and I think that shows up in the show. I think there's, there's a sense of roughness on the, in the first one and even to a certain extent in the second one that I think is pretty much gone in the third one. You know, we've figured this stuff out, and all the energy could go into the, the creation of the images, not fighting the technology to make those images. Programming the spaceships in the Star Wars films, I thought sort of really about what the attitude of the, of the pilot might be. And some of them, you know, you don't spend a lot of time thinking about this, but you can add like a skid to the motion of a spaceship when it's going around a turn that you see and you sense it, and it, it looks better because you've seen you know, race tr cars in Indianapolis skid around a turn, and it just looks really nice. So you put stuff like that into it, and you can relate to it, and it just, you know, it adds a, another level of, of connection to it. So that the audience can relate, oh yeah, you know, I bet that's right. That's not only right, that's really neat. There's a, quite an effort to keep the cost down on this show. No matter how big it looks, you know, there's, it's like, it can always, it's always too expensive. And we, Dragon Slayer had been pretty expensive to do the go motion stuff and that, and we were looking for another way to do this sort of creatures that were, that were cheaper. And we thought about, I think we thought about rod puppets, but we wanted to try, George wanted to try, and we thought, okay, we'll give it a try, this guy, a guy in a suit, if we can make the suit interesting enough. So Phil Tippett came up with an interesting idea where you've got, I think there's a person in the middle of the suit, but you've got another guy on the, r on the left and another whose right arm is in it, and the guy on the right whose left arm is in it, and if you can mat all those people out, you get a you get a, a shape, a moving shape that is nothing that a person could ever do in a suit. So it would look a lot more unique and interesting. But it didn't quite make it. You know, it, it, when it was all said and done, it still looked like it didn't move right. It's got all the problems with with sort of uh, you know care with, with big soup things that that have to react to gravity and and things that are just like tip offs to uh, you know they're like Muppets. They're like just big Muppets, and people are so used to what those type of puppets look like that, you know, because you you're w playing with them from the time you're a year old, that you just can't fool people and that stuff. So instead we went with the rod puppets and we made a uh, figure probably about this tall, about 18 inches, and it was all worked from below. The head and all was cable actuator from below. The arms were controlled from around the elbows going out below. It was in a miniature set with uh, probably about four or five puppeteers and, you know, and the camera guys, we were just like jammed right up against it, shooting it. And we did it uh, sort of as a live action shoot. Uh, we shot high speed though, sometimes we shot backwards. Anything that we could do to get it away from that, again, that sort of Muppet, rod puppet look. And, uh, you know, we'd go, so I think there were maybe a couple of scenes that were shot under cranked also, whatever we could do. And, and then Mark was pretty much either split screened in to it with, from the set done over in England, where he was blue screened into the foreground on that. So there's a lot of cheats in that shot, I mean, in that sequence. And if you, you know, you don't ever quite see the whole character, and you don't see it quite walking. But for the film and for that point in it, you know, it was just, you know, it was fine for it. And it didn't really need to show any more than what it did. Dealing with the real redwoods, which we were, because we had all the actors shooting all the plates, in a lot of ways made it, it's always easier to do it because this, we could visualize 99% of the shot. All you had to do was, like, just visualize where the walker was going to be and, and what its behavior was going to be in the shot. That was a lot of fun shooting that stuff up in uh, Northern California and uh, with all the pyro charges in the trees and everything going off and we had multiple cameras shooting the big moments when, when everything would happen. It was just, uh, you know, it was really spectacular and, that, and then going through all the footage and finding the bits and pieces, you know, that George was going to use for the, uh, for the stuff was really, you know, really pretty neat. The, uh, the bike chase sequence was a whole different set of problems and that, that was like racing through it at 100 miles an hour. And there's no way to do that. You know, we could go along a road, but how do you get rid of the road? And, and you know, you can run, but how you can't run 100 miles an hour on a motorcycle and you'd crash. You know, that was a whole different, a different thing. I really, in my mind, treated that as a completely different thing than the, the uh, other than the Walker sequence. Uh, 
at the beginning of the sequence, the original conception of it, uh, George asked Joe and I to figure out sort of, you know, he said, well, here's the beginning of the sequence, and here's the end, and you guys kind of, you know, do what you want for the middle and, and let me know what you got. So we started thinking about it. We did some storyboards on it and, uh, and came, uh, came up with quite a bit of it. And then George looked at that and said, no, 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 no. That's a good start, but. And then he went and, and refined it and made it, uh, you know, this big elaborate sequence that it is right now that was so big that it was hard to even figure out where to begin orchestrating how you're going to make this sequence. Because again, it's like 105 shots in three minutes. And you've got side views and forward and backwards and explosions and, you know, tracking shots and locked off shots. And oh, it's just a huge thing. But the setting is kind of basically sort of the same. So what we did was we did an animatic on it, which is a, a, a little version of it with a, a brand new camera that had just come out, a little video camera that was like only about this big with a little lens on it. Now they're all over the place. But at this point, there wasn't anything really that small. And we did the whole thing on videotape with, with little model dolls. We had dolls about this big and made little plastic bikes like this and had rods coming out of the back of them and set up on a table, a four by eight sheet of, of plywood, uh, a fur the rug that we got uh, from a local fabric store and some, some cardboard tubes for the redwood trees and a couple of lights to light them and then sort of held these as like little toys and you could hold the camera then in the other hand. The camera wasn't this big you know, camera for shooting video was a small, lightweight one, so they could be as flexible as the scene needed to be, because the scene had to be really flexible. And we did, over a period of like two or three days, we did the, an animatic, which is essentially the film. And you can compare it to what's in the film, and they look, you know, almost exactly the same. Now that we were out of the storyboard stage, and we had visuals to look at, and everybody agreed, yeah, this, the visual of it, the running footage of this looks really good. Then we could break it down to how many shots we had looking to the front, how many shots looking to the back, to the left, to the right, how many were like one-off shots. And then we could schedule it. We thought at the beginning about building a miniature forest that we could race through uh, motion control. But in order to be able to just to get the speed, because the idea behind it was an incredible sense of speed, plus there was a huge number of shots. It was like it's 105 shots in three minutes. There's some incredible amount of work in that, in that little self-contained sequence. Uh, but I decided to try a test, and we shot it right at Samuel Taylor Park here in Marin County, uh, of a Steadicam, which is a device that, that Garrett Brown made years ago. And I actually had Garrett fly out, and we did a test of just walking through, shooting at a very slow frame rate, one frame a second. And the Steadicam sort of stabilizes the camera as he's walking through. And then he has to kind of think very slowly about what a, an, a pan to the right, or like racing around a corner would be, and very slowly navigate the steady cam around like this corner. So you like don't move quickly like you're driving a car, you kind of look ahead 300 feet and now you begin this slow embankment as you're walking toward that very slow. And when you project it at normal speed, it's got this incredible sense of speed. So we started, you know, so once we had the technology worked out as to how to do the backgrounds, then the whole sequence got a lot simpler. And we didn't have to focus our attention to building these big models. Uh, we built small models about this, probably about this long, for the the uh, sort of medium shots and longer shots of the guys on the bikes, and we shot those at a, on motion control, but at a very slow camera speed, with like as our first sort of experiments we got into uh, in rod puppets that we later, li literally later in the show, used a lot more in the Rancor sequence, and which means you can sort of grab a, a rod coming out of Luke's back and out of his helmet and moving again very slowly as the camera shooting one frame a second you can get some good choreography of the, of the characters, making them look like they're on the bikes because their hands are sort of attached, their rear ends are attached, their legs are attached, but all these joints, if they're free and flexible, can move around. They look like they're sort of moving around there.